Hello, yes. Um, OK, I don't want to say an awful lot, but um, I've known this man for longer than's good for me. Um, it's a little known fact that we actually started the York University Photographic Club together. There, there, put that in your diary. <laughs> um, and from that, many things have bloomed. Um, the one thing I can say with great certainty is that ever since I've known David, I call him Dave, but now we're here, I'll call him David. Um, he's always enjoyed getting his head kicked. Um, so that kind of d sort of accounts for the shape of it. But, you know, it's been a sort of lifelong ambition of his to be sort of kicked by every policeman in England. And he's kind of slowly getting there. But there's kind of more of them and they're getting younger, as you might have noticed. Um, so, but the consistency that David has shown in documenting if you like, the sort of underbelly of our society is quite striking. The un by the underbelly, I don't just mean the dispossessed, but that is obviously part of what he has done. But the sort of <coughs> dirty bit, you know, the National Front, the police misbehaving, um, such things. And he's done that consistently for a long, long time and continues to do it. And I give him great credit for that. So I've never said that before to him. So like, <laughs> Take delete, delete. Years. <laughs> um, so I will uh, hand over to him to show you some of what he's been doing and some of the reasons why he's been doing it, I guess. Well, I'm going to show you a bit about what I think the war on photography is. I see the war on photography being waged on three principal fronts, legal, financial and individual. I doubt there's a photographer here who hasn't experienced attempts to prevent or control who and what you photograph. We see rights grabs, reduced fees and sales income, and a general expectation that photography requires no budget, as someone on work experience can bang off a few shots on their mobile or download something from Flickr in the lunch hour. If you haven't experienced anything like this, please stay for the discussion at the end. We badly need to hear from you. This is very much a personal perspective on, the, on those fronts on the war on photography, informed by the way I've worked over 30 years as an independent photojournalist. So, where did I start? My first published pic was from a student demo in 1963, published in the Daily Mail, two or three guineas, I think. For those without a freedom card, a guinea uh, was £1.05, a posh quid. My career doesn't seem to have moved on much since. I'm still shooting the same subjects and getting offered about the same fees. <laughs> Another thing that hasn't changed is that I was arrested a few minutes after taking this picture. I didn't think of that as the first engagement in the war on photography at the time, but it did sort of set the tone for what followed. I carried on with photography through two universities, a few years of truck and van driving, and a design course but there wasn't time to both earn a living and to do serious photography. Discovering squatting meant that I could give up working at rubbish jobs just to pay the rent. Squatting brought me into conflict with authority in a positive way. It gave me an opportunity to use photography in a context relevant to my life. Housing conditions, slum landlords, police, bailiffs, evictions. Taking over an old tenement block in Whitechapel and housing the Bengali families ignored by the council brought both activism and racism into focus. It was easier to get commissions in the late 70s. Just getting a picture to come out sharp and with decent tones was a skill that few had, but I hated the business of going around publishers, getting commissions. I remember taking my smart box of shiny new prints to a big book publisher, proudly pulled out the first one and promptly slashed my finger with the edge. So I spent the next 15 minutes trying to impress an editor while clutching an increasingly red, drippy, blood-soaked hanky. <laughs> I knew then that going from desk to desk, hoping for commissions, was not going to be for me. The realism of what I was doing appealed to book publishers. They're nearly all gone or absorbed into faceless media conglomerates now. Researchers would send me a picture list for a forthcoming book. I'd shoot the pics on spec, and at the same time I'd shoot other stuff around the same subject. Maybe a pic was wanted of damp, leaky flats, and I'd spend a few hours hoovering up the whole estate. 
I soon built up a small archive of reportage at a time when few agencies had that sort of material. Most were carrying only unrealistic, glossy, posed agency shots. Then there was a wet crypt beneath St. Botolph's Church in Allgate. There were some damp cellars where street drinkers would gather in the evening to drink and talk and fight and get a little food. It was a scary place. On a cold night, there could be 60 or more homeless, mostly alcoholic and or addicted, badly damaged men and women. It was very loud and chaotic, singing, shouting, swearing, the thick stink of old clothes and rarely washed bodies, mixed with meths, cider and piss, frequent violence, frequent threats of violence. The ability to photograph this freely, completely unsupervised and with unselfconscious subjects is ground we've completely lost in the war on photography. During the Brixton riots in 1981, the Sun published some photos, not mine, of looters, calling for their readers to identify them. Overnight, protesters learnt to regard photographers as informers. The neutrality for which we'd been accepted was destroyed in a couple of tabloid editions, opening up yet another direction from which photographers would be attacked. Oppression plus authority is always photogenic, and cameras attracted both, even back in the 80s. This was the first Stop the City demo. It was the only large violent protest I've ever known kick off before breakfast. <laughs> Kieran, our stranglee here, had just snapped Sergeant Strangler, demonstrating his complex carotid plus windpipe plus jugular plus pressure, pressure point party trick. Seeing that he'd been photographed, our nice sergeant drops his victim and grabs Kieran. I shoot off three frames, that's the middle one. Strangle cop drops Kieran and comes after me. I leg it, jump in the cab, and I'm gone. So he goes back, picks Kieran up out of the gutter, semi-conscious, gives him another good squeeze for luck, and takes him off to the nick. With Kieran banged up, London's finest rewinds the film in Kieran's camera, removes the cassette, takes out the spool, holds it up to the light, so as to destroy the incriminating picture of him just strangling the other guy. He then reloads the film and winds it forward to where it had been before. His lawyers contacted me, and later I did some CSI. That's uh, Kieran's lawyers, not the policeman's. Uh, I did some CSI on the film, and the patterns of the fogging and some tiny scratches proved exactly what had gone on. And Kieran walked free with damages and an apology. That was a small victory for our side in the war on photography. The simplistic authoritarian worldview that I saw in extreme racist groups seemed another manifestation of that same ordering, controlling force. I got to know who the main figures were, covered many of their marches and rallies, and built up a body of work that drew publishers to me and gave me the chance to expose these racist groups in ways that I'd hoped would slow their advance. The racists, of course, got to know me too. I was pretty dismissive about the death threats, though I did, <laughs> I did fireproof my letterbox, until I read in the paper that one guy, who on our last meeting had said, I'm going to kill you, Hoffman was now serving life for murder. The racists recognize me, and they hate me. So while other photographers are getting shots of them trying to look like normal human beings, I'm getting them cursing at me and snarling. I appreciate that. It makes for some very good pictures. I built up a relationship with Searchlight, a small but very effective anti-racist campaigning magazine a consistent thorn in the side of the racists, and exactly the sort of place where I want my work to be used. The far right were more difficult to cover in the 80s. There were far higher numbers, their marches were far bigger than we see now. Thousands of them, but they made the ground shake with their big boots and drums. It was much more violent. With fewer police around, demos could be a bit more physical too. I recall once 
Heidi up a tree and list to photograph who was attending a paramilitary National Front training camp. Walking back to the car with my minders, we came round a corner and walked straight into a surprise bunch of thugs. They thought we were an ambush, and having spent the day in paramilitary training, their reactions were lightning fast. While we just stood there working out what was going on, they turned and ran. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> Pollution, drug use, poverty, protest, these are all different angles that I've been using trying to see to show some underlying dysfunction in society, some way that we're just not getting it right. Of all of these, it's been protests that I've kept returning to. I spent the 80s specialising more and more in the rough end of protest. There was a constant demand from publishers, and Thatcher made sure that our supply never ran dry. Papers supporting Thatcher wanted to show how we needed a strong government. Anti-Thatcher papers wanted to show the anger she was generating. Our world was rich in publishers looking for fresh work. Small book publishers, many magazines, the newspapers, they were all greedy for images, no longer. The attrition of that once rich world of photo-filled magazines by predatory bean counters is one more battleground in the war of photography. With pricey print vying with free internet outlets, most photographers are now feeling the pinch. The sort of street photography that I spend most time on is often described as bearing witness, making a record of how that part of our society is working. But of course it has an interventionist effect too. The neutral observer is a figment. We may try to be invisible as we work, not to influence the situation by our presence, but our true intention is always to maximise the effect of our pictures on the viewers. If we see protest as a physical negotiation as to the nature of the future, then it's photographs that actually set the stage. Cops and public order provide the skirmishes in the war on photography. Can't stand here, can't go there, move away, leave now or I'll arrest you. I find that slightly encouraging. It confirms that the state too understands the effect that photogra photographs can have. I want my images of protests to facilitate social change, not only to be a record. It's the use of the images as a catalyst accelerating and reinforcing those changes through the feedback of publication that interests me. Next. I'm less concerned as to which cause lies behind the protest than I am in people's need to protest and the way in which the state tries to suppress it. It's in photographing protest, or to be more specific, the state's reaction to protest, that I find the strongest images of the clash between individuals and the constraints of society. Okay. It's also a fact that images of clashes on the streets are far more likely to end up in print in the mass media than images of glorious speeches or of petitions being handed in. And unless I'm getting the images, the issues, published, there's not a lot of point in taking the pictures in the first place. I've been lucky growing up in the 60s. For most of my life, there have been good picture literate, picture greedy magazines, papers, TV programs, books, all of which had reasonable budgets and wide circulations. If I managed to get interesting images published, then I just couldn't help making a living. That world is history now, all battles lost in our war on photography. We're attacked on many fresh fronts now. I had thought that digital cameras and the internet would be a boost. Easier to get work seen, easier to take pictures under difficult conditions. It's the opposite that's turned out to be true. Digital photography has increased the quantity of work available and made it far more accessible, driving down the prices and dividing that budget among far more photographers. Good work is easily drowned by the sheer volume of the mediocre. So many documentary sites and online magazines, each looking to publish photo features, but none being willing to pay for them, has meant a flood of hobbyist work superficialising the language of the photo story and leaving so little room for professional, paid work. There's a degradation of the visual language too. There are hundreds of billions of badly framed images with horrible colour being produced every year. These were almost entirely amateur photos of someone's loved ones, someone's family or friends, and our ideas of quality just aren't relevant to these readers. For them, this is the visual language's vernacular. Publishers who once would spend time and money getting well-made images now find that a blurry, wonky shot with a colour cast or a free smudge from Flickr goes down just fine on the page, and that's just more money for the shareholders. 
Paid work has been driven out by free. This withdrawal of income is forcing photography, particularly documentary and reportage, into hobby status, as more and more photographers are forced to spend more of their time earning money in some other way. What is the future of photojournalism when there's no money coming in? Digital distribution has led to the rise of massive, massive image consolidators that we now see, led by Getty. Once, Britain's images were sourced from several hundred diverse picture libraries, returning half their income to the creators. There are few of these left now. We have 90% of images distributed through just a handful of massive super libraries, with their long distribution chains each taking a cut and their subscription deals disconnecting royalty payments from the suppliers of their images. They now return just a few percent of their income to the people who actually make the images. For many editorial publishers, particularly in the local and regional press, independence and integrity are simply unaffordable. There is no code of conduct behind a crowdsourced image. There's no training, no professional reputation. In a growing number of publications, neither publishers nor readers have more than a passing interest in the concept of balanced coverage. And this, just when things couldn't get worse, they get worse. This case popped up last week. A local paper, the Reading Post, has just blown a new hole in the wall of our copyright protection. They lifted photos from a website for a police appeal story. And when the photographer claimed for the use of his pictures, Swindon County Court decided that no copyright protection existed, as some of the people shown may have been breaking the law. This really is an extraordinary development. According to this judgment, any photo of any possibly illegal activity is incapable of copyright protection and may be used by the press without permission or payment. Where does that leave pictures of my protesters trying to break through a police line or an environmental demo occupying an office? If I can't control and charge for the use of my work, how can I make a living doing it? The war on photography has been pretty personal at times. Greenpeace occupied the Canadian High Commission. Everyone else was chained to fixed solid objects. I was arrested simply because I was portable. <laughs> the nice young PC Constantine here makes a charming study in this self-portrait. <laughs> the campaigning by groups such as I'm a photographer, not a terrorist, and the press coverage of plainly ridiculous cases of abuse of Section 44 of the Terrorism Act by the police has given us arrests for photographing, wait for it, a chip shop, <laughs> Christmas lights, a church, a wedding, and an owl. <laughs> we, were now, we are now finally forcing the police to scale back their abuse of the terrorism laws and even to reconsider their attitude to photographers. Back in 1963, the war on photography had begun, but it was then a gentleman's war. Now we're subject to overwhelming force. Just staying upright can be a challenge. We routinely take helmets and shin guards to demonstrations. The police were particularly heavy-handed during the Salman Rushdie Satanic Verses protest, and the media were clearly targeted. As I was photographing one arrest, a large copper ran at me, deliberately straight-arming my camera, right into my face, cutting open my forehead. Pleased with his work, he sauntered off. When I followed and took a picture of him, he grabbed me in a bear hug and said the only truthful words I ever heard from him, you're nicked. That's me, nicked. Back at the police station, I was amazed to hear his tale of how I'd assaulted his colleagues and had been shouting, it's a free country, as if. For added realism, he placed his made-up story in the middle of a real incident that had taken place earlier. That real incident had taken place at 5.25, and my photo of the cop had his wristwatch clearly showing 5.40. That proved I was free and photographing in a different place 15 minutes after the incident in which he claimed to have arrested me. I was very lucky to escape a false conviction for assaulting the police officer, but all too often the police get away with invented stories, and several of my colleagues have picked up convictions quite wrongly and unfairly over the years.
That was the G20, April Fool's Day. <laughs> the G20 last year showed how readily police abandon their pretense of policing by consent. Perhaps they've finally overreached themselves. G20 has made even the most knee-jerk supporters of the police rethink. The death of Ian Tomlinson, the flood of complaints, the images that we saw of brutal policing, these have forced a process of reassessment among senior officers. On demonstrations, we now have a hotline to the police press bureau in case of problems. Thanks to our campaigning, the forward intelligence teams no longer try to intimidate us. The Met and ACPO have come out with statements recognising the public right to protest and our right to report. I've noticed a clear scaling back in the numbers and the aggression shown by frontline officers. One demo that would have attracted 10 or 15 van loads of TSG at the start of 2009 was attended by just a fat, smiling sergeant in the WPC last month. There are cracks in the wall We've gained some ground as to the use of the terror laws and on policing of dissent. We need to consolidate those victories and start making inroads with regard to the extension of the privacy laws, bullying, copyright grabs, the bleeding of money away from the creators and into the pockets of the distributors. We need to organise better, to communicate better. This is the time for all our professional organisations and groups to stop looking inwards to their income streams and their internal politics and to look outwards to the mass of photographers that they need to unite if we are to come out of the war on photography still producing strong, important, serious work. Thanks. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think there's plenty of material there for people to get their teeth into, as it were, <laughs> um, and for a range of questions I'm hoping from the floor. There should be, I, I'll just kind of go on to one little aspect that David didn't cover, which I feel is part of a sort of war on photography, in a, in a sense, which is a sort of cultural war on photography. Um, photography spent its whole history being sort of excluded from art, as it were, by, by art until very recently. And it's interesting how, in a sense, photography's turned on itself so that this work, work of engaged photographers, is definitely not something that the cultural establishment of photography would endorse or be interested in. There is a sort of small turd in the middle of uh, Soho. It's called the Photographer's Gallery. And, and it, it sort of gives out this sort of effluent stench of kind of self-congratulatory sort of uh, superiority. And, um, you know, sadly, it, even on its website, it actually says we represent photography in all its forms. Now, that's not simply a trope. <laughs> a word they like, is actually a lie. And, um, you know, it seems rather sad that the current sort of climate, if you like, in the broader area of photography seems to have its sights turned de in a very, very blinkered way away from the kind of work that engages people in the ongoing realities of society in which they live. I think it's a disgrace, um, but there you go. That to me seems to be part of the war on photography as well, but from a different angle. So I'd like to throw it open to the floor to come up with some interesting questions. Oh, hang on, you're going to get a mic. It, it was just ooh, early on in the talk you mentioned, though, you showed some of those photos in the crypt. Yes, it's a model. And you said church. that we'd lost ground completely in being able to do that kind of photography. photography. Yes. 
that interested me because I nowadays really keep out of those. Um, <laughs> I'm just amazed seeing how much you enjoy <laughs> enjoy being in the thick of it. I was, don't, I don't enjoy it at all anymore. It was I'm trying uh, well, to keep clear because I've been in a few situations which have been really frightening. It was the people who ran and the. I just, crypt. I just sorry, wondered sorry. why why yes. why we why you felt that you could, couldn't still do the crypt type photography. Could There's a number of reasons really, but it's the sort of pusillanimous paranoia that, that seems to be penetrating us from every direction. In, in 1979, I think it was, I did those, yeah. and I was approached by the vicar of the church who said he wanted to do some fundraising and would I take some pictures of the activities, uh, particularly the crypt. Uh, and I went along and I, first time I went there I was scared witless. I stood on the top of the steps looking down and the smell and the noise, I didn't dare go down the steps. I mean, I had to really force each leg to help. But after a while you get used to these things. Um, I was given completely free access. There were people shooting up heroin, people fighting, there was serious violence, there were people overdosing, drinking meths, mixing meths and milk. Um, I was given completely free access to shoot what I wanted, do what I wanted, come and go as I liked, publish as, as I wished. Nowadays, firstly, the wet crypts don't exist because of health and safety and you can't let people do those sort of things, so they have to do them in some even more squalid place rather than under supervision where there's a doctor on hand and people to help. And secondly, they would never allow a photographer to record that sort of activity. What, you mean the vicar wouldn't allow you anymore? I don't think it, any, any organisation that provided shelter... I mean, I've done stuff on the homeless with St Mungo's and people, yeah. and they're incredibly controlling. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've lost the ability simply to go in, observe, take our pictures, be trusted, and, and use them, and, and be trusted to use them sensibly and in a positive way. But certainly, I do documentary making, and that would be difficult for... With the BBC, it would be difficult for health and safety. Yeah, I'd say. and permissions. And permissions. You'd have to get all yeah. those guys' yes. permissions. But the vicar might still let you do it. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, that sort of a project just couldn't yeah. be done now. I think it's, you know, it's a serious loss. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, I was interested what, what the charge was on your first arrest. I think it was... I, I was trying to remember that when I was writing this, and the reason I put it in is I wasn't sure. It, I think it was breach of the peace, or behaviour likely to cause a breach of the peace, uh, because we were chaining all these women to the railings outside the House of Parliament. Um, were you prosecuted? I was brought to court. Um, it was announced on Radio 4 in the morning, the Today programme. That was the first my parents heard of it. <laughs> I was living at home. <coughs> the girl in the picture's father phoned my dad up in a fury, getting his daughter nicked. <laughs> he still hasn't forgiven me, I think, if he's alive. Um, I, I can't, again, I can't remember if I got bound over or conditional discharge. There was a, f a small fine that the Student Union paid, a few pounds. And do you think you're more likely to sort of get up charges that stuck then than now? I think it was less likely, though. I mean, that wasn't a trumped-up charge. I mean, I was chaining women to the railings outside the House of the Parliament. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, they had a point. <laughs> I don't see they needed to charge me, but they did have a point. No, I, do, I, I think that now police have much more freedom to make stuff up. I don't know if anybody here remembers the Challoner case, a police sergeant called Challoner who put half brick in the pocket of a protester that he arrested. And that made, made the Times front page it made the, when he was caught. It made the news for weeks. I mean, the whole police force was shaken by that. I mean, that sort of stuff happens all the time now. Um, over here? Is it, it was, uh, I was just wondering, given uh, what you were saying, and also I think the um, <coughs> most importantly in, in the war on photography, I think the, the, or perhaps the war on photographers would be more accurate, the, um, the cheapening of the image by, by, the, by digital photography and digital distribution, perhaps, um, do you think the war is over? Do you think it's lost? Do you think we should be looking at some, some other future redefinition of what photography is going to be? Or do you think there's still hope? Do you, you know, is there the never give up attitude? Or will we actually see things righted? Or, or is, it, is it history, that kind of photography? I'm not a giver-upper. So I, I cling to the idea that there is, there is something going to come for out the other side. But I don't see what it is. I, I am really worried by the fact that there's no money. There's just no money. I think and that's the point. I mean, actually, yeah. every photographer... <coughs> Excuse me. Speaking as a photographer myself, every photographer I meet these days, the first question is always, how are you making money? Yeah. You know, I mean, for photographing money? cars, there's, there's money. 
you know, if you're doing the sort of high-end technical photography, there's money. But for the sort of street-type reportage of our society, there is no money. There's, there's so much free stuff. Um, I've noticed an interesting thing with sites like Demotics and Social Documentary Net, uh, and there's a whole bunch of sites like that. They're, they're still publishing uh, the social issues type features that we've seen you know, for the last 50 years, but they're much less well shot. They're shot by hobbyists. They're shot by people who only really put in maybe four or five weeks of photography a year. They're not shot by people who are being paid to spend six weeks doing something. So. The, the, the quality of the reportage, the quality of the features we're seeing, there's far more features, but the quality of those features seems to be going down. They're more superficial, they're more trite. Um, most needs for illustration can be sourced for free, really easily. You just go onto the web, you pull out a dozen pictures, they're done. Why, why pay me to go and shoot them? An awful lot of my work was people who'd paid me to go and shoot something quite dull, like the opening of a health centre. And while I was there, I would shoot I don't know, some old people wait in the waiting room or someone in a consultation with a doctor. And I'd get some quite nice, useful, deeper pictures while I was there. That doesn't happen because there's no one commissioned now. There's just somebody who will shoot a picture on a cheap little camera and they'll give it away to the press and that, that's that job done. So I don't see how we're going to be saved, but I kind of hope we might. <laughs> so the answer then to the question is that, yes, the war is lost. It's not lost till we stop fighting. I just don't okay. see how I we're like going to win it. <laughs> I like that. It doesn't mean we aren't going to win it. The fact that I can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. A lot of phot photographers I know are going over to video now. They're thinking that you know, by doing video clips, they can get into a different market and maybe do that. But of course, the, the same forces that have overrun still photography are going to overrun video. That will be cheaper and free. I mean, now Final Cut Pro is a complete head and mash. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, soon there'll be easy ways of doing that. So it'll, it'll be the same, that people will just be producing little video clips for nothing. Yeah. Well, they already are. Uh, well. But I mean, I, I actually disagree with you. Oh, good. Uh, there's nothing unusual <laughs> there. <laughs> um, First did that in 1963. Uh, well, I was thinking that when you were doing the, um, the soundtrack on the crypt, it's like most of our conversations. <laughs> uh, but the... More coherent. <laughs> Slightly more coherent, yeah. The, the, um, no, what I disagree with is actually there's, there's some very good stuff out there on, on the web. There is. I there's mean, some very good I stories the, the, and there's some good sites. The problem is that it's not being, I mean, in principle, we looked at the internet as this sort of savior medium or once upon a time, a long time ago, perhaps, that um, was going to allow the photographer to be the author, to put their own work out there, to do all this stuff and, uh, you know, go around the, the, the mediators, the, the, the Rupert Murdoch's, the, the people who mediated the, the uh, access to the imagery. But of course, the big problem, it, it is that thing, but the big problem is how do you draw an audience to, to the site and how do you monetize it? And neither of these issues have been solved um, and don't seem likely to be solved in the near future. You know, the mediums out there, the internet, but making it kind of work for photography, other than just sticking it out there in random hope, is um, uh, the big problem. I've put a dozen stories into Demotics over the last year. I've made about 70 pounds. <laughs> Hello. I, I think um, Homer Sykes, I think basically it's a new industry. The net's a new thing for all of us. And I think you know, the people that want to make money from the net i.e. the big companies, the Murdochs and the co, will eventually be doing that. And we will be able to monetize our, our websites. You know, if we think about photography, it's been going for 150 years or so. It's changed enormously in the last, well, it's always been changing. But it's changed enormously in the last kind of 10 years. Um, before that, we were kind of still arguing about prices. And I really do believe that if you search engine optimize your websites, you keyword your pictures, you can reach a bit audience. We're just at the beginning. In five or 10 years' time, I really believe that we will be able to monetize our websites and we will be able to get a flow of income. I think seven agencies do it now. Some of the agencies are beginning to do it more and more. And it will happen. It's just we're going through this period when it's really, really, really difficult. But I think, you know, with regard to money for pictures, which is what you've been talking about in part, 
I think, you know, you just have to stand up for your rights and you have to just argue for more money and not just hand over to the agencies that sell pictures for very, very, very little. Stand up and be counted. I mean, we've got you know, two of the biggest agencies in the world, based in Seattle, that have been screwing the system right, left, and center. And the only way for us as photographers to do anything about that is to stand up and be counted and say, no, you want your pictures removed or you want them put in a different system. Otherwise, they will carry on looking after their interests, not ours. Any room comments on that? I think it's fine. <laughs> it was a statement, not a question. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for that um, show. Uh, uh, it was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to the issue that, that you talked about earlier about um, permissions. And I totally understand your statement that the sort of sequence that you did in the crypt would now not be possible and so on. But there are situations where I think it's valid to need permission, and I think that there are individuals who in a way need to be protected by that requirement. Do you, do, where, where, you know, where would you, how would you define, how would you describe the situations where you would accept that permissions are valid, or other situations where you would feel that if you've snapped the picture, then it's, it's yours to use? I take a pretty brutal view myself. Um, I think if something happens in my life, then I'm entitled to photograph it happening. And that photograph is mine. Having, yes. having said that, there are situations where I have photographs and I think, actually, this is better just kept to me or thrown away. I have destroyed a few pictures in my time, and there's plenty of pictures that just don't go out because I just look at them and I think that can't be used in a good way. Okay, then may, may I yeah. create a fictional yes. uh, example? If you were in the crypt and you took one of those pictures and it was published, the vicar had invited you in, but the individual in the photograph was in a situation that he didn't want people to know he was in, but you make that public yeah. by your photograph. You feel that that's valid because, simply because it happens? Yes. He's done it. I mean, if he's doing something, if I misrepresented somebody, that would be a different matter. But if I'm accurately and fairly representing what was happening, then I don't see that, well, I don't personally have a moral problem with that. Okay, well, it was a question. I'm yeah, not testing yes. you, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Others see it differently, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I pretty much feel that if it's, if it's a part of the real world, then it's a part of the real world, and the real world has a right to see it. I think surely also, you know, the, the guy in the National Front crowd in your face. Yes, he would not give me permission, would he? Exactly. I mean, but he's in public place. So yes, but I mean, yes. Well, yes, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, in a way, because I dislike them so much, I'd be willing to sort of break certain moral rules. But essentially, I think it would be unfair to go into his back garden when he's having a racist barbecue <laughs> <laughs> and photograph him and his racist mates having his barbecue. But if I was invited there and I just took some pictures casually, then I'd have no hesitation about using them. Could be invited there to be barbecue. Yes, well, this, is, <laughs> this is rather more likely. <laughs> I think we're too, too squeamish, honestly. Come on. <laughs> more. I'll go on if you like. No, no, we want to get somebody else. Uh, well, you, well, we'll come back to you, but just, I'm going to point at somebody in a minute. <laughs> go, go ahead. Um. Uh, thank you for your talk. Well, I've heard you. your talk before at, our, at my uni. Oh. Um, it's very interesting. But I just wondered, we sell your badges, or the I'm a photographer, not a terrorist yeah. badges, and I just wondered if you could explain a bit more about what, you know, the, the whole idea behind that, that thing and where you want to take it. I'm not very much involved with it now. I was, uh, I, I just heard and I started it, um, it with a conversation we had after Red Eye Conference in the spring last year. Uh, but I'm a bit lazy. And most of the work on it has been done by Jess and Jeff Moore. Um, they've really taken it forward a lot more than I have. I, I'm just sort of in the background of it now. But the idea was really to show the absurdity of the way the terror laws were being used. 
At Red Eye, we had the owl reference I made uh, was because a wildlife photographer had been in a park with a tripod. No, actually, it wasn't a park. It was a street by a park uh, with, with a tripod and a camera at night. And he was photographing an owl perched in a tree somewhere. And he was stopped under Section 44, and he was searched and given a hard time and taken off and told he could, you know, he was suspected of terrorist-related activity. And, I mean, it's just, just, you couldn't make this stuff up. The fish shop reference was a, a fish shop called Mixed Place. There were hundreds and hundreds of occasions. I mean, I was stopped four or five times now under Section 44, doing absolutely nothing that, that would draw attention. In fact, there have been, I forget the figure, but it's more than 100,000 stops under Section 44 in the country. And how many of those have actually turned out to have a terrorist implication? None. In all the terrorist incidents we've seen, how many have used photography? None. No terrorist incident ever has used photography to wrecky the joint or to do any, of, do any of it at all. And yet we have these stupid laws. The reason for that law wasn't anything to do with terrorism. It was simply to extend the powers of the police. And the police use it in such an unreasonable way that we felt the campaign was needed just to, just to make a fuss, to have a sort of hook. We could hang these cases on that would get the press interested, get the photographic press interested. Uh, and that's really what it's done. It's been really successful. We had an event outside Scotland Yard uh, over Section 76. We've had the recent one in um, Trafalgar Square last weekend. That was the last picture of the guard with his hand up from last weekend. Uh, and each time it does make the press, it does get a lot of coverage. And the police have really drawn back on this now. Uh, instead of the blanket Section 44 covering the whole of London, they've now decided that it actually needs to cover a few small places here and there. Um, in Tower Hamlets, there are no stops at all under Section 44. Section 44 allows the police to stop without reasonable suspicion. They don't need any reasonable suspicion at all. Why? Why would they want to stop someone if they don't have a reasonable suspicion? <laughs> it's daft. Um, the campaign, I think, has been one of the more effective ones. It's been a very underplayed, cheap campaign. We've sold two or three hundred pounds worth of badges. The website's cost 20 or 30 pounds. You know, it, it's, it's nothing. It's been a few T-shirts. The sales of the badges and T-shirts have paid for all the expenses. Uh, and it's actually changed the way the police are acting. Not just on its own, but with the other, the other interventions as well. Uh, another angle um, from um, I'm a Mary Sohn and I come from the film industry, so we're seeing big changes digitally, obviously in everything. And I, my angle was the war in photography, maybe from an analog to a digital area, and the differences that that makes. So, you know, when you film, when you shoot digitally, there's no stop. You can do, you know, you have 16 whatever it is, megabyte thingies and gigabyte what is, and you can carry on forever, whereas you just have to reload and you might miss something. And so there was this sort of choice about, you know, you had 36 frames or whatever, or however, 20 frames. And I wonder, is do you think it's going to disappear for completely analog, you know, chemical stills and the value of that depth of field and the quality of color and all the things that digital doesn't have? There's still people producing uh, platinum prints, still people producing cyanotypes. Uh, so I'm sure there will still be people producing silver halide-based imagery in 50 or 100 years' time. Yeah, but I think there'll be artists uh, or specialists in some other way. I, th I think in terms of production photography, digital is such, so much a, a superior tool. It goes into darker situations. It lets you get the pictures. For example, one of the techniques I use a lot is I'll shoot at a quarter second on something in a demonstration and I'll just shoot 20, 30 frames. And usually one will be sharp enough to use. Now, I'd never have shot off a whole roll of film on the off chance like that. So it's actually opening up ways in which I can take pictures that I never used to take pictures. Uh, and I think the quality is better. I think the tonality is better, the color is nicer. Yeah, the no, downside of it, the, the downside of it, exactly, is that it, it ceases to be a, a rare skill that you can sell and becomes a really simple That's thing. Quite an interesting yeah. Point about the war is not yeah, I mean, I think digital is great, but I should be the only one allowed to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I actually think since Kodak came out with their sort of early cameras, I mean, photography has been a pretty democratic process right from the day one. Um, OK, you haven't been able to shoot a 1,000 frames on one card, but, you know, I, I think people do have a certain amount of discipline, you know, you, that you bring to, bring to your photography, hopefully, um, using digital. 
uh, I welcome it. I think it's a great move forward. You know, I don't care if there's other people doing it. The, uh, you know, what I do care is if, if nobody cares about the work that I'm doing and won't pay for it. Um, you know, it's, it's a free society. People are allowed to take digital photographs if they want to, and indeed, they can try to monetize them if they want to, you know, by selling them off. You know, there's not a law that says you can't sell a photograph cheap. The people who earn livings from photographs would like there to be such a law, but that would be a sort of, a bit of a sort of section 47 of <laughs> photography if that was enforced. But um, no, I think it, I think it's uh, it's a great advance actually, digital photography. I'm not, I'm not arguing that it isn't. I'm just saying that whether you think it's going to survive. I think it'll survive, as, as David said, in, a, in people who enjoy playing around with processes, you know, and that'll be it, really. Because you, you, you can already press the sort of Kodachrome button to kind yes. of, you know, get your Kodachrome look or whatever, you know. Um, so I think we should maybe, if there's a couple of questions left in us, uh, there's one in the corner here. Hi, this is just in with regards to your, your work in general. You always manage to get in the thick of it and, and get some really, really great action shots. Are there any tips besides us a lack of fear and common sense that you could, you could throw our way? Or be is a bit, it building be relationships? A bit slower than thick helps. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly if you don't see it coming, you get closer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not really, no. I mean, you just have to go in there and when you, when you see something happening, you just have to run towards it. Um, and you have to go to an awful lot of events where nothing at all happens and two guys and a dog turn up, you know, and you go home again. Um, you don't get many action shots, really. Do you find that um, there are particular relationships that you've built with people who keep you in the know of interesting things that might be happening? Yes, I mean, most, most of my colleagues, we, we swap information, we, you know, we, we, especially now it's easier with mobile phones, we, we text each other about what's happening where you are. Um, do you know what's going to be happening later? Do you know if these people are going to march off somewhere else? So the technology and having a number of photographer friends does help. Um, but really, it's still mostly luck and, and just getting off your bum and going out and, and seeing if anything happens. Thank you. OK, I think, can we go at the back here? Because you haven't said anything yet. Oh, thank you. Um, hi. I'm just wondering what you think about this uh, apparent difficulty for professional photographers to, uh, to earn a decent living and sell their work. I mean, do you not think this has something to do with the, uh, the sort of the wider trend in the media industry of everybody having to do everything? So in other words, that people working for newspapers are getting retrained uh, if they were a writer to edit video, to take photographs, to, to be able to edit texts, and it's just turning into a sort of a... I don't, I'm not sure really how to phrase it, like a polymorphic world. Everybody has to do everything, and it's, it's specialists are getting rarer and rarer. Yeah, it, there's a, a real de-skilling been going on for a long time. I mean, I guess it started with Eddie Shaw, and then was really consolidated in the mid-'80s with the News International strike. Um, but, but the whole of our industry has been just de-skilled and de-skilled. Uh, each technical advance, just like we were saying with digital and film, each technical advance has meant that you can get people who have less training. Uh, you can draw your potential creators from a wider pool, and that means you can pay them less money. Um, and that, that is constantly driving down the level of skill. Uh, it, it's what you're saying. Uh, Not necessarily driving down the level of skill. Well, I've, okay. Just broadening it out a bit and making it. Well, I think it does drive it down. I think when you've got a, a journalist taking notes, doing a bit of video, and grabbing a couple of stills, you're not going to get such a good story as in the old days when maybe a, a still photographer and a journalist will go out and work together. And, uh, and with that goes the fact that they probably have to do four of those in a day, five of those in a day. Whereas again, maybe there'd be one or the most two before. So I, I think it really drives down quality and, and you don't need the same skill. Anything to add to that? No. <laughs> We've done that one. Next one. <laughs> Uh, do you think there are any pictures that shouldn't be published? Sorry, say that again? Do you think there are any pictures that shouldn't be published? There's a few of me that I've managed to suppress. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean, my answer to the chap over here, I think, holds. If it, if it happens in the outside world, then 
I think it's, it's fair for anyone to show it to other people who live in that same world and say, this is what's happened. What about respect for the victim or, for example, the, the uh, person who was um, shot dead in Haiti for looting? Um, what about her? Well, her well firstly, I, wouldn't, I, I, I probably wouldn't class it as looting. These are people trying to survive, trying to find stuff to survive with. But someone who was shot dead in those circumstances, yes, I think you should show that picture of them being shot, or having been shot. And I think you should show it with a text that puts it in a context and explains that the failure of the aid organizations or the ways in which the Americans are running the airport or whatever it is has led to the food shortages, has led to the fact that these people have to try and grab what they can when they can. Um, I don't think there's a reason not to show that. Uh, if, if someone is... I, I guess if, you know, if there was a rape victim lying in the bushes, then I, I, I would be very hesitant about using that picture. But I don't think there's an automatic rule saying it mustn't be used. I just think you have to think of how it will be used and what the effect of it would be and take a personal responsibility. If it's your picture, then you should take a personal responsibility for, for how it's used. But if you sell it to a paper and they have a different agenda and they use it in a different way? It's difficult. I mean, there is a degree of control in selling pictures to papers. Um, and I don't think it's right to try and assume that you will win every, every single round with the newspapers. I mean, I've sold many pictures to newspapers, and on a couple of occasions they've been used really badly. There was a picture I remember from the Brixton riots um, of a couple of, of a black guy getting, I think it was in here, getting kicked in the face by a policeman as he's running away from, from trouble. That was put next to a story about three black men rape Vicar's daughter. Um, and I felt that was really, you know, I felt really bad about that. It really hurt me. There was another occasion when there was a peace demonstration blocking the Whitechapel Road and the standard ran it right across the front page with the headline, CND holding hands with the IRA because they were arguing that the police were having to deal with this and not with the IRA at the time. Um, again, I mean, that really upset me and it damaged my relationship with the peace protesters who had invited me along. But in fact, there was then a lot of complaints against the standard. Uh, the complaints were upheld, the standard changed their policy, and maybe in the end it did more good than harm. I think... Can I ask I one more question? I'm sorry, no, I just, I think <laughs> you're, one of the things you're, I mean, central to your question is really about co contextualizing the work. And I mean, it's an old uh, truism that, from Daumier, I think it was, you know, who originally said that f photographs describe everything and explain nothing. And that remains true now as it was then. You know, it, it's, it's incumbent upon the photographer to provide the context in which the event is that has been photographed has been taken and to try to get at least the media who are using it to comply with that sort of that information. A last one, I think right in front of you there. I, I, I was just wondering whether you detected a, a squeamishness, a greater squeamishness on the part of, of the media to, to, to purchase the, the really shocking image. Uh, you, you sometimes kind of hear as a prelude to, to television footage that some of, the, some of the pictures you're going to see are going to distress you, uh, and in fact they don't distress you at all, or kind of an, an, a kind of an adult wouldn't be distressed by them. Uh, and I contrast that with kind of 20, 30 years ago of the images that you used to see in, the photo, in, in newspapers and in the news where quite shocking images would be seen and actually affect some sort of change. Uh, and, ha you know, one remembers the, the Vietnamese girl running down the, the road after a napalm attack, the, the Vietnamese uh, soldier shooting the, shooting the Viet Cong suspect. Do, do you detect any, any greater squeamishness on the part of, of, of the news media now to buy those sorts of images? Yes, I think there is a lot more squeamishness. They're always happier to publish pictures from a long way away. So the Haitian looter shot is easier to publish than, say, an English looter who'd been shot had there been one. Um, but it's, it's part of the same thing that, that we were talking about earlier, about permissions. I think newspapers and all the media, uh, and, and the population generally, are much less willing to, to really engage with the, the nasty, messy, snotty, bloody end of life. They want things to be a bit simpler, a bit easier not to really look at those things too closely. And I, I think it, it permeates all aspects of our lives, not, not just the, 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 the choice of pictures to be shown. But yeah, I think you're right. There is, there is certainly more squeamishness now. 
Right. I think, you know, there's um, an interesting little discussion taking place. I think we probably have to sort of bring it to an end for now. I'm sure there's David's not going away. There's plenty of questions you can still ask him. Um, but for now, I'd just like to say thank you, and I hope it's given you plenty to think about. Thank you, David Hoffman. <laughs>